What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Tuesday in the fourth week of Lent, we're continuing on through the Gospel of Mark. We're into Holy Week now. It's going to slow down. We've got a great quote from Martin Luther and some more words on baptism for our Lenten catechesis. Stick around. <music> So we're still hanging out in the 12th chapter of Mark, and this time they're going to put Jesus to the test. They're really mad at him at this point, and they really don't like him, and they're really trying to set him up for failure. So let's turn to Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took up a wife. And when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, you have, not, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to Moses, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Well, <laughs> uh, hardcore Jesus today. Um, <laughs> so if you watch some of my other videos, you'll kind of hear me talk about what, what Luther would call a two-kingdom theology. And so we see that plainly here. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. So there is uh, this kingdom of the earth and this, this kingdom of heaven, and uh, God has instituted this kingdom of government for our good order and for our discipline and to punish wrongdoers, and, and we should render unto them what is theirs. Uh, but also to God what is God's, and more importantly that. And what belongs to God is uh, obedience to the civil authorities. Now, when the civil authorities... Uh, forbid what God has commanded, well then uh, we hearken to the words of the apostles, we must obey God rather than man. But uh, this question of the resurrection, it, I wonder if this is the verse where um, people go to and they're like, oh, heaven gained another angel. I will come back and haunt anyone who says that about me. I will find a way. Um, <laughs> this is a very comforting passage. Um, for any of us who have faced death in the face, looked death in the face, now, I, I'm fortunate, eight years and two tours. Um, I've not had to do that in that capacity, but I've been by deathbeds. I've been by my mother's and I've been by my brother's. And I've watched them die. And the hope that we have as Christians is not actually that they're in heaven. Jesus points to the resurrection. That is the hope of the Christian, that we will rise again. Um, and he's very critical of people who don't hold to the resurrection, isn't he? So this is obviously something very important to Jesus. And these wonderful, wonderful words uh, of Moses. Uh, in a previous, in a Lutheran Lemonade video, I talked about the proper distinction between law and gospel. Turns out there's a little bit of gospel to these words. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. 
of the God of the living, not the dead. So now we have this wonderful, wonderful passage. This not passage. This verse, not verse. <laughs> quote from uh, Martin Luther regarding faith that uh, is is quite deep and profound. Faith is a firm trust that Christ, the Son of God, stands in our place and has taken all our sins upon his shoulders, and that he is the eternal satisfaction for our sin and reconciles us with God the Father. He who has this faith, devil nor hell nor sin, can harm him. Why? Because God is his protector and defender. And when I have this faith, then I am certain God is fighting for me. I can defy the devil, death, hell, and sin, and all the harm which, with which they threaten me. This is the great, inestimable treasure given us in Christ, which no man can describe or ga grasp with words. You are holy if you believe that God steps in for you and stakes all he has and his blood for you, as if he were saying, Fall in behind me without fear or delay, and then let us see what can harm you. Come, devil, death, sin, and hell, and all creation. I shall go before you, for I will be your rear guard and your vanguard. Isaiah 52, 12. Trust me and boldly rely upon me. He who believes that cannot be harmed by devil, hell, sin, or death. <sighs> I'm reminded of... Uh, of Jesus words and I think they're they're poignant for the time uh, do not fear man or anything that can destroy the body don't worry about that fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell but faith clings to the promise that Christ is our Savior our mediator he stands in our place and pleads his blood as our righteousness and so that whatever, hell, death, Satan, devil, sickness, war, what doesn't matter, whatever comes, whatever might destroy this flesh, well, no, we have the hope of the resurrection, don't we? Because Jesus stands in front of us to guard our souls and our bodies for the resurrection. Now, our Lenten catechesis continues on. Uh, we've talked about the Ten Commandments. We've talked about the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. And we started out with baptism. So now... We learned a little bit yesterday about what baptism is. What benefits does baptism give? These uh, from the large catechism portions of the Luther's large catechism. Since we know now what baptism is and how it is to be regarded, we must also learn why and for what purpose it is instituted. We must learn what it profits, gives, and works. For this also we cannot find a better resource than Christ's words quoted above. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. The power, work, profit, fruit, and purpose of baptism is this, to save. 1 Peter 3, 21. For no one is baptized in order that he may become a prince, but, as the words say, that he be saved. We know that to be saved is nothing other than to be delivered from sin, death, and the devil. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. It means to enter into Christ's kingdom, John 3, 5, and to live with him forever. Here you see again how highly and preciously we should value baptism, because in it we receive such an unspeakable treasure. This also proves that it cannot be ordinary mere water, for mere water could not do such a thing, but the word does it. And as I said above, so does the fact that God's name is included in baptism. Where God's name is, there must also be life and salvation. Psalm 54, 1. So baptism may certainly be called the divine, blessed, fruitful, and gracious water. Such power is given to baptism by the word that is a washing of new birth, as St. Paul also calls it in Titus 3, 5. What God does and works in us, he intends to work through such outward ordinances. Therefore, wherever he speaks, indeed, no matter what direction or by whatever means he speaks, faith must look there. It must hold to that objection, or it must hold to that object. Now, here we have the words, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. 
Mark 16, 16. What else can these words refer to but baptism, that is, to the water included in God's ordinance? Therefore, it makes sense that whoever rejects baptism rejects God's word, faith, and Christ who directs us to baptism and binds us to baptism. Interesting. I, I love, I guess I've never noticed really Luther's uh, insistence on God's word and and saying of the water that it is is a, a precious water, a, a, not a holy water, but uh, it, it's not ordinary water. At the, well, at the same time, Luther also says it is just plain water, but it's water uh, com comprehended in the command of God. So the word being the main thing, it doesn't matter how much water does it. If you have a lot, use a lot. If you have a little, use a little. Uh, the Didache, uh, written in the, the late 1st century, early 2nd century, talks about how to baptize uh, in living water. But if you don't have living water, use other water. If you don't have warm, use cold. Uh, and if you have little water, the instruction of the early Christian church was to pour it on the head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting that those of us who understand 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you, that we understand it is God's word connected to the water, uh, as it's referred to as Jesus washing by the, the washing of water with the word in Ephesians. It's interesting that we don't care how much water, because it's, it's God's word that uh, speaks over the water and does the thing. Um, <laughs> just like uh, God's word speaks over Jesus' spit and saliva to heal God always works through means, doesn't he? So it's interesting then that those who believe baptism is our work insist that there must be much water. Uh, but those who know that it's God's work make use of the water that they have, trusting the word and promise of God attached to the water, not the volume of water itself. It's fascinating. You have to be baptized by immersion, even though it doesn't do anything. And if you're not baptized by immersion, it's not going to do the thing that it doesn't do. <laughs> Well, let's, uh, let's close this one out with a prayer and uh, get on with our Tuesday. Lord God, Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, your servant Moses proclaimed the resurrection to the children of Israel to give them hope in the midst of their darkness. As we journey to the darkness of the cross, give us hope to look beyond it to the light of the resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.